the oil of sperm whale is all over my leather seats to make it extra soft and to protect the coating. What? Clearly, I am the much finer male specimen to John Hamm and make this Imperial look a lot sexier. What? Before you today is, in my opinion, the greatest luxury car made in 1966, the Imperial Crown Convertible by Chrysler. I also think this is a super underappreciated classic land yacht. This is just because everybody has forgotten about them. There's plenty of people out there that covet the Lincolns and Cadillacs of this period and drive up the prices to insane levels, but these Imperials are still affordable, at least for now. I've bought one and now I'm making a video hoping to make it go up in value a few cents. But for now, and probably forever because I'm overvaluing my influence a little bit, this is a rare convergence of one of the best cars for the best value. So the few people who know these cars know that the nomenclature gets messed up pretty often. These are Imperials. They are not Chrysler Imperials, even though later they did become Chrysler Imperials. But back in the 60s, Imperial was supposed to be its own brand. And that's because Lincoln and Cadillac was really fancy. And I guess Chrysler didn't think their name was fancy enough to put it behind their flagship land yacht. And I call it a land yacht, but actually in the brochure right here, which looks like it's right out of Mad Men, they call it its own island. Let me explain here in the brochure, your private island. So quiet as silence is eerie at turnpike speeds. Each minute behind the wheel erases tensions of mind and muscle. It is an experience you'll look forward to after a hard day's work for as long as you own it. And if you look at this brochure, it's just beautiful. The artwork, including an exact copy of my Imperial Convertible right here, this thing looks like it was drawn up and written up by Don Draper himself. And coincidentally, Don Draper actually drove one of these in Mad Men, a 64 Imperial convertible in red. But clearly, I am the much finer male specimen to John Hamm and make this Imperial look a lot sexier. Right? Am I right? What? I could go on about my natural studliness all day, but let's get back to the car. I actually bought this Imperial convertible not even 24 hours after Jay Leno gave me permission to buy cars again. If you all don't remember, I actually went on his show. It's going to air sometime in the fall, so I can't give details, but he blindfolded me and took me for a ride in three of the cars, and I had to guess what it was. It was an amazing experience, and then afterwards, he gave me a full nickel and dime tour of his garage. It was like the greatest experience of my life. Maybe not the greatest experience, but at least tied with my wedding and the birth of my child or or It's up. It's it's up there. It's up there. But anyway, Jay Leno also loves Imperials He has two of them in his garage that I know of and I got to see both and it made me fall in love with them all over again I actually owned a 66 Imperial once before it was a crown coupe and I had to sell it because I was going broke in my car dealership and I couldn't afford to keep it so I sold it for like eight grand that's it. That's all it was worth, even though it was a really nice original, original paint, original everything car, and it ran and drove great. They're just super undervalued. Now, the convertibles are much more valuable than the coupes and sedans, and that's just because they're much more rare. Of the only 500 or so made, I'm not sure how many are left, because like all convertibles, water gets in, they start rusting the floors, and then they're all junked. So I paid $20. $2,000 for this Imperial convertible and I snapped it up in an instant and it was for sale in Southern California not too far away from Jay Leno's garage so after looking at his Imperials I went online and there was one just a few miles away my lack of impulse control was back in full force and here it is you got to admit compared to other classic cars $22,000 for a car of this pedigree build quality and condition this is a mostly all original car a few panels have been touched up over the years but the interior is original engine transmission everything it's an unrestored car and still in amazing condition if this were a suicide door lincoln convertible it would be worth double this or more in this condition and if you think it kind of looks like a lincoln just a little bit well, there's a reason for that. When Chrysler was trying to completely redesign Imperial, get it away from the big fins and the excess of the 50s, those ridiculous looking cars, they stole away Elwood Angle from Ford, who also designed the Lincolns of the era. And he took a similar paintbrush to this Imperial with this large knife edge line going down the car. But in my opinion, this car is much prettier than the Lincoln, not in the general shape, it's, it's very similar, but the little touches make this Imperial 
really special. This butter knife edge just sticks out a little bit more than the Lincoln and looks really sharp with the kind of bullet nose in the bumper, but the grill is really where it's at. And the headlights are sealed up in glass surrounded by a beautiful gold inlay. Just super classy. And then the hood ornament, I'm a sucker for hood ornaments, and the Imperial's Eagle hood ornament is among the prettiest, I think. And you find more Imperial logos throughout the car, including on these beautiful turbine hubcaps in the interior all over the place. And then in the back as well, and it actually folds down the big Imperial Eagle, folds down to reveal the fuel filler. Looks aren't the only reason why I think this is the best luxury car of 1966 and one of the best luxury cars of all time. There's a lot more to this car than a pretty face. and It's the way it was built. These cars were built in their own assembly line on their own chassis. There was no sharing it with a lesser Chrysler or Plymouth or anything else. The Imperial had its own dedicated chassis, body, everything, assembly line from the ground up and 1966 was the last year of this. And these cars are so overbuilt, it's ridiculous. It's why the paint holds up on these so well. You see so many Imperials with original paint like this one, as well as the chrome. Something about the chrome on the Imperials just holds up so well. It's astounding. Also, this car is really stiff for a land yacht, and that's because of its thick perimeter frame. And they actually banned Imperials from demolition derbies in the 70s and 80s when these were pretty much worthless. People would bring these to demolition derbies and totally dominate because the frame stuck out so far and you've got like two feet from the front bumper actually hits the radiator. So there was no way you could kill an Imperial in a demolition derby, especially compared to a unibody car that would just fold up like an accordion. And that's why they were so sought after and often banned. Now with Imperial, there was a lot of pride of ownership with these cars. That's why there's initials on the door with this car. Obviously someone was so proud of it that they put their initials of the owner on the driver's side and the owner's wife on the passenger side. That's why the letters are different. And also the vehicle has its Serta card still. This is amazingly original. So when you would take the car in for service, the guy changing the oil could take this out, write down the person's information on the ticket, and then put it back in the car. So the original owners were named E or E Bilka, 78 Academy Hill, Derby, Connecticut. I really need to Zillow that address. I wonder what it looks like today. Now, you're probably starting to glance over at the engine now, and if you're a Mopar guy, you know this is really special. 1966 is the last year of the hand-built, dedicated assembly line Imperial, where they actually built the cars in a climate-controlled facility so much so that they kept the humidity and pressure at a certain way that the fresh air would go out and no dirty air could come in. Now, that's common practice today, but in 1966, they were definitely tooting their horn about it in the brochure. But the engine here is very Mopar famous. It is the 440, the first year of the 440 cubic inch V8, the big block in any kind of Chrysler, Dodge, or Imperial. Of course, it's much more famous for being in the Charger. And once again, if I had bought a Charger with this engine in this condition, I would have paid double for it. But I have the same 350 horsepower, 440 cubic inch in a beautiful luxury land yacht. And the car doesn't drive like a typical land yacht either. It's actually really impressive. Now I do have one gripe. Somebody put on an aftermarket muffler in this thing because they wanted it to sound like a Mopar hot rod. That's gonna get fixed. It also has a loose hanger. Oh, come on. There we go. Has a little bit of a rattle from a loose muffler hanger, but still, sounds pretty good. Oh man, I feel so much cooler than I actually am right now. <laughs> the first thing when you sit in this thing, you are in awe by the quality of it. And that's because they really went all out with the materials on this thing. And when they describe it in the brochure, it sounds like they're describing a Rolls Royce because the wood here is actually a real walnut and it comes from 100 year old walnut trees. And only 5% of the walnut that they actually get is good enough for this car. The seats are leather, of course. They're original leather seats and in pretty good shape considering they're over 50 years old. But in the brochure, they advertise something that they would never advertise today or even put in cars today, and that's whale oil. The oil of sperm whale is all over my leather seats to make it extra soft and to protect the coating, I guess. 
Another thing they advertise is you're never more than a few inches from an ashtray. There's an ashtray right here underneath the radio and then two more in the back seats for each rear passenger. But back to these seats, they are unbelievable. It's six way power adjustable and they are super soft and cushy like an old land yacht like you would expect. But also they curved the back to give you extra lumbar support. So it really is the perfect seat. It is so nice. And when it comes to driving this thing, it is the perfect land yacht experience as well because I can drive it using only my pinky. It passes the pinky test with flying colors. But unlike a lot of land yachts, this one still feels really stiff. And that's because of its really, really beefy frame. Yeah, I'm in a car that's like a cloud and I'm floating over bumps right now, but it's not that wallowy, at least not compared to say my 76 El Dorado, which is a unibody car and it has a lot of flex, a lot of creaking and that kind of stuff because the quality just isn't anywhere close to the same. So you have all of the benefits of old school construction with the quality, with the sturdiness, with this comfort, but also you get all of the modern features because we're well into the 60s. I have air conditioning, I have power brakes, I have power steering, and that 440 engine, which at 350 horsepower gets up and moves this car pretty good. And that's something that quickly died out in the 70s as we got more emissions restrictions and insurance standards choked the horsepower out of these cars to where a 440 cubic inch 10 years later is making less than 200 horsepower. So we're in the sweet spot of this era, the best of old and new, where you can talk about having a 100 year old tree on the dashboard and sperm whale oil on your seat and pollute the air with a big block engine that can also break the tires loose, which I think I can do right now. There it is. <laughs> it's just, it's just the perfect luxury car, the perfect land yacht. It's certainly a different era when a car company would brag about killing whales and then putting their oil on a seat. So if you're an environmentalist, you're probably not too excited about this car, but if you're a connoisseur of land yachts and you want one of the best ones ever made and don't want to spend a bunch of money, you got to admit this Imperial is an incredible value. Obviously I didn't buy the cheapest 66 Imperial convertible in the USA because it's not worth it because rust, you don't want to buy a car with rust, but I still did manage to buy a broken one and environmentalists, I'm very sorry, but my land yacht is doing a great impersonation of the Exxon Valdez right now and leaking a lot of oil wherever it goes. This thing loves to mark its territory. It's probably good for rust proofing, but not in the new garage. So I'll get it up to the car wizard soon and figure out what's going on. Thank you for watching.